Well, Merry Post Christmas. If you're watching this in real time, you are watching on the day after the fact where everything is starting to wind down. Uh, the tree has lost its appeal. Uh, the food that was meticulously prepared has found its way into Tupperware containers. All of the relatives have left or need to leave. Uh, the presents have been presented and the naps have been scheduled. You are starting to unwind and decompress and hopefully have some time to reflect on everything that you've received during this Christmas season, how God has been good to you. Here's the deal. Yesterday was all about what you got. Today is all about what you didn't get. According to the National Federation of Retailers, December 26th is the best day to go get what you didn't get, to go back to the store with that well-intentioned present but wasn't on your list anyway and switch it out for the thing that you really wanted. Today is the day to ask, what is it that I got that I didn't want, and what is it that you wanted that you didn't get? There's been a lot of anticipation, anticipation and expectation that went into Christmas, and the disappointment in not getting what you really wanted can sometimes be stressful. And I'm not just talking about presents. I mean, seriously, this whole holiday, you can lose the entire Christmas spirit with that just with that one strand of lights right in the middle of the Christmas tree that chose not to go on. The rolls got a little too dark. The turkey was just a bit too dry. So-and-so didn't show up. Or so-and-so showed up but didn't behave. It would be interesting to know how much of that $500-plus billion Americans spent this year on Christmas actually bought the happiness and fulfillment all of those Americans were looking for. Sometimes life is as much about what you don't get as what you do get. So Christmas, in the Bible, there are two different accounts of how this first Christmas went down, and I'm sure there were a lot of things that Mary and Joseph would have wanted to get but didn't get, like a regular room at a hotel, for instance. Uh, but here are some post-Christmas perspectives. Think about this. Christmas is the most celebrated holiday in the world. Everybody loves Christmas. We put so much time and effort and money into celebrating the birth of Jesus, and you don't even have to be a Christian to do so. Uh, the most uh, expensive Christmas tree in the world is located in the Emirates Palace Hotel in Abu Dhabi at the cost of $11.2 million. That's right. Uh, you are looking at an $11 million tree decorated with Rolex watches and diamond bracelets. This by the way, in a country that makes it illegal to believe in Jesus. <laughs> so what is it about Christmas? We have four historical records documenting the life and teachings of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, we call them the Gospels. All four of them tell us about John the Baptist. All four of them record the feeding of the 5,000. And every one of them include various details of the death and resurrection of Jesus. But only two of them, Matthew and Luke alone, actually tell us about the birth of Jesus. Only two of them thought Christmas was important enough to put in their writings. Mark, in his gospel, doesn't mention it. John doesn't mention it. He alludes to the coming of Jesus, but from a whole different perspective. The most observed holiday in the history of mankind. And two of the writers that documented the life and teachings of Jesus left that part of the story out. The birth of Jesus gets no airtime. Why is that? And what's more, John, one of the gospel writers that skipped the first coming of Jesus, devoted an entire separate book on the second coming of Jesus. Doesn't mention the first coming, but describes the second coming in fantastic literary prose. We've come to the end of the Christmas season, come to the close of what churches have for centuries called the Advent season. It's not a biblical term, but it's certainly a biblical concept. Advent means coming. The four weeks prior to Christmas is set aside for preparation and expectation of the coming of Jesus. At Advent, we celebrate the fact that Jesus came. But there is a second element to Advent that often gets missed. Not only do we celebrate the coming of Jesus in Advent, we anticipate the return of Jesus at Advent. Those two things come together at Advent. In fact, 
Anticipating the second coming of Jesus gives reason for celebrating the first coming of Jesus. I mean, it just makes sense when you think about it. Why celebrate the first coming if you don't believe in the second coming? Uh, Believers in Jesus forever have been grounded in faith and hope. We believe that Jesus came, but we also look forward to Jesus coming again. The promise of Christmas is about the God of heaven who came to earth so that one day those on earth could go to heaven. So it's heaven, my friends, not Christmas, but heaven that makes all of this worth celebrating. So in that second writing, John did his best to give us a taste of heaven. He writes this in chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away." Heaven will be an awesome place for everything that we find there. Elsewhere, Paul, uh, John tells us in his revelation about streets of gold and gates of pearl and dates, uh, days that never end because God is our eternal light. Jesus promised us a home in heaven just made for us. Heaven will be awesome for all of the things that we get when we get there. But you have to understand as well, heaven will be equally as awesome for everything that we don't get when we get there. John uses this phrase, no more, three times in this passage. So here's what I want us to do uh, today. Christmas, the first coming of Jesus, reminds us of all the things we get because of Jesus. Heaven, the second coming of Jesus, reminds us of all the things we don't get because of Jesus. And John gives us three. Revelation 21, 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death. No more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. So, First thing we don't get in heaven is death. No more death. Over the past two years, we have been overshadowed by this inescapable reality of human frailty, this human existence that is so limited and temporal in ways we've not experienced before in our lifetimes. But friends, putting the present pandemic aside... We understand it's estimated that one out of every one human beings will die at some point. It's not something we like to think about or talk about, but death is the main reason why Jesus came the first time. And death will be the reason why Jesus comes the second time. Hebrews 2.15 tells us that Jesus shared in our humanity to deliver all those who through the fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. We are slaves to death in this world. But Jesus came to eliminate it, to take it out of the equation, to erase it from our experience. Some of you celebrated Christmas this year with one less loved one at the table. I did. For some, this has been a year of the valley of the shadow. Why? Because we have an enemy who wants to kill, steal, and destroy And his mission is to defeat us with fear, to rob us of joy, to distract us with pain, and divert us from the purpose to which God has called us, all because of the reality of death. We have no one to blame but ourselves. The Bible tells us that sin brought death into the world, and I am the one who sinned, you are the one who sinned, and so in this life, this is our reality. Death is a part of the human experience. But the first coming of Jesus reminds us that this baby born in a manger was born to die so that we wouldn't have to, and that one day he will come again to destroy death forever and to free us from fear. Here's the deal, my friends. If your identity is in Christ, then your home is in heaven, a place where sorrow, crying, and pain 
has been replaced with singing, dancing, and rejoicing. One of the things we don't get in heaven is death. Here's another thing, darkness. No more darkness. Revelation 21.5 says its gates, heaven's gates, will never be closed at the end of the day because there is no night there, no night. Human experience confirms we most fear in the dark and we most hide also in the dark. Those gates will never be closed. You travel to the ancient world and you will find centuries-old cities protected by massive stone walls guarded by enormous iron gates. Even today in Israel, the old city of Jerusalem is surrounded by incredible walls and massive steel gates. When I was there several years ago, uh, there were three of us in our group who decided to take off one afternoon on our own to explore the old city. Uh, Our guide for that entire trip told us uh, that we could do that, but warned us of two things. Uh, The first thing, stay together, you know, don't go off by yourself. And two, when it gets dark, get out. Because in Jerusalem, in the old city, when the sun goes down, all of those massive steel doors that separated the old city from the new city closes, and nobody gets in and nobody gets out until sunrise. Because Middle Eastern cities are no different than any of our American cities. Bad things tend to happen in the dark. (laughs) In the ancient world, people built walls and installed gates to keep the enemy out. And they closed those gates to protect themselves, especially at night when the enemy loved to attack. The most common place to fear is in the dark. That may be true of the old city of Jerusalem. It may be true of downtown Chicago. But John tells us in heaven, in heaven, those gates are never closed because it never gets dark. In heaven, you have nothing to fear because you have nothing to hide. John goes on in 21, the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the lamb is its lamp. Here's the deal, friends. The light of Jesus not only exposes the darkness, it cleanses the darkness. When I was a kid, whether it was in the closet or under my bed, when I was gripped in fear, all my parents had to do was turn on the light and show that there was nothing to be afraid of. And now, as a follower of Jesus, I understand the Lord to be my light. So who, of whom shall I be afraid? Just like Jesus exposing the dark around me, he also cleanses the dark within me. He has taken my rebellious heart and filled it with the light of his grace. The lamb is my lamp. Imagine a life where all the walls you've built over the years to keep the unwanted out, the gates that you have installed and closed and bolted to protect yourself from hurt, the doors you have hidden behind to shield your shame. Jesus has now come, and he is now the door to your freedom. So you have no reason to fear, and you have no reason to hide. He has exposed the darkness. He has cleansed the darkness. Imagine a place void of guilt and shame, a place where you are free to know and be known, where you can be loved without rejection, because the darkness in our hearts has been transformed by the light of his love. No death, no darkness. Here's the third gift we don't get, disorder. No more disorder, disease, discomfort, discord. No more chaos, conflict, or confusion. No more brokenness, frustration, or despair. Friends, the the Bible is very clear on this. We live in a broken world, broken by those who live in it. Back in the garden, when we rejected the perfection of heaven, we spoiled everything else. It was our impurity that created the corruption. Our world is now subject to decay, and nothing works like it should. But even though it may be our fault, friends, we are not left without hope. This is John's message to us. Everything that got broken in Genesis gets mended in Revelation. What's wrong at the start of our story is now made right at the end of our story. Listen, one of the reasons why believers long for heaven is because of the things uh, we get in heaven that we don't get on earth. We don't get justice on earth. How many times have you said, that's not fair? 
We learn very early in life that there is a code of ethics by which the world ought to operate, but it doesn't. Fairness is broken. The bad guys go free and the good guys get hammered and it gnaws at us. We long for something better. We don't get justice and we don't get satisfaction. Sure, from time to time there are good times, but the good times never never last. They always end. Solomon, in fact, wrote an entire book of the Bible focused on this very fact that life never really measures up to what we're really looking for. What we really want, we don't get. And what we get, we don't want. C.S. Lewis tells us that the dissatisfaction in this life is simply evidence of a better life that exists, what George MacDonald called the unnameable something, the unnameable something. This world is the only world we've ever known, so we can't quite put our finger on what that something really is, but we know that there's something out there, something more, something better that we've got to get. Friends, that longing is heaven. The place where the curse is reversed. What was lost gets found. What was shameful gets covered. What was offensive gets forgiven. What was separated gets reconciled. What was broken gets restored. What brought sorrow gives birth to joy. We celebrate his first coming. We hope in his second coming. He has come and he will come again. And when he comes, sin will be defeated and death will be no more. And he will heal all the disorder of our lives. But until then, Satan's days are numbered and this broken world is put on notice. Fear not, for behold... I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all of the people. What is that good news of great joy? Well, Jesus himself tells us in Revelation, Behold, I am making all things new. These words are trustworthy and true. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment, without cost, free to all. The promise of Christmas is fulfilled, friends, in the reality of heaven. He has come and he is coming. But until then, he has not left you or forsaken you or abandoned you. His love will never elude you. His peace will never leave you. His joy will never disappoint you. His grace will never fail you. The day is coming when he will right every wrong, bind every wound, and wipe every tear. Here's the deal, friends. Heaven will be heaven, not because of everything that you get there, but because of who will be there. I mean, I was thinking about this. I mean, if your reason for going to heaven is just to pick out a mansion, I, I think you're going to be a bit disappointed. Gold doesn't satisfy here. Why would it satisfy there? Whatever you get in heaven will pale in significance to the matchless splendor and majesty of the presence of Jesus in your life. He is our light and he is our life. He will set us free and he will crown us with his steadfast love and mercy. Merry Christmas to all who long for his appearing. No more death or darkness or disorder. Eternal joy at his right hand. Maranatha, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Father, thank you for all that you've given us this past Christmas season. But Father, we thank you for the promise and the hope that you've given us in that home that you have prepared for us. And so Father, may we, with eyes of faith and hearts of devotion, continue to follow you until that day that we are forever with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.